Okay, so welcome everyone to um, uh, our sixth webinar uh, for uh, the AMDA D2D session. Uh, this session titled Optimizing the Use of Antipsychotics. Uh, we're excited about this one. We're excited about all of them, but we're really excited about this one. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I just want to remind everybody, like we do, uh, participation is encouraged. Please, uh, please uh, use the chat function, and uh, we will be we'll be watching for that and answering your questions. Next slide. So, what I wanted to start with is I wanted to start with some current events and. Um, there was a White House fact sheet that came out on February 28th um, uh, related to nursing homes, the quality of in nursing homes. And there was the things that you would expect, uh, staffing performance, transparency, a big focus on who owns nursing homes, and of course, our favorite oversight. But there was also a piece on safe and adequate and dignified care. And in this piece, and I underlined what I wanted you to take note of, uh, thanks to CMS National Participation uh, Partnership to improve dementia care in nursing homes, the nation has seen a dramatic decrease in the use of antipsychotic drugs in nursing homes in recent years. However, uh, the inappropriate diagnoses um, and, and prescribing still, still occurs. So I, I wanted to focus on that with you for, for a moment because um, what's nice about that is it dovetails very nicely into our, into our talk today on antipsychotics um, by Dr. Stephen Levinson. So what's good about that is that the use of antipsychotics has decreased some, but we all know that there are times when we GDR meds that shouldn't be GDR'd or we GDR meds and psychosis presents itself again. And rather than bring the antipsychotic back in, we'll see folks adding other drugs, which complicates things. The piece that um, uh, the, the task force focused on that I wanna draw your attention to was the inappropriate di diagnosis piece. Dr. Levinson's talk today will really uh, put the cart before the horse. And the cart in this case, even though this is de-prescribing and it's always been about drugs, um, the cart here is actually a well-considered diagnosis. So in this case, in this context, without a well-considered diagnosis, the appropriate use of medications is nearly, ne is nearly, nearly impossible. So we're going we're gonna to spend some time today, Dr. Levinson is actually uh, speaking to us about um, diagnosis and what medications do. Next slide, please. Um, this is our this is our friend Mrs. Smith. Uh, she's been with us for many 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 months, and you remember Mrs. Smith. She's 88 years old, former school teacher. Um, I won't go through her story again because you know it by heart. Next slide. Um, and she's on Seroquel. So here you can see the work that we've done through the previous five months, um, working on Mrs. Smith's. Uh, um, a medication profile and de-prescribing. Um, after Dr. Uh, Levinson's talk, we'll be speaking to you. We'll be we'll have a question about the use of Seroquel. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Levinson, um, um, who uh, has spent 43 years providing and overseeing long-term uh, care and long-term care and post-acute care. He's been a medical director in 22 different nursing homes in Maryland, and he's also reviewed and guided care of thousands and patients, thousands of patients in, in 28 facilities across the United States. He's uh, authored or co-authored 80 articles. He's written four books on medical direction, subacute care, quality improvement. And starting in 1992, he worked with uh, Sam Kidder on the uh, one of the CMS's original pharmacists. Uh, to develop the CMS original unnecessary medication and GDR guidelines. So it all started back in 1992 and Steve was a part of that back then. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Stephen Levinson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining in. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to um, 
present something you've all heard many times before. So one question you might have is, uh, what are we going to hear today that we haven't already heard? And who is this guy that um, we should believe or listen to what he has to say more than or at least as much as what we've already heard for the last couple decades? Well, there are some good reasons, as we'll see, I hope. And Michael alluded to some of that. I have been doing this for a long time. I was a house officer or a medical resident almost 50 years ago. And so I became very familiar at that time with a lot of the original generation of a lot of drugs. We had uh, people who would come in from the nursing homes around Baltimore on things like uh, Thorazine and Stelazine and Melaril. Um, of barbiturates, which were a big deal back then, Valium and Librium, chloral hydrate, Halcyon, a lot of the old, old line medications. And we saw a lot of uh, pretty tricky and difficult situations. So it was really in the 50s that um, antipsychotics, the first uh, antipsychotic, which was uh, Thorazine, got going around the mid-50s when I was um, in elementary school. And by the time I got through medical school and into residency, um, these drugs were beginning to be used a lot more, and um, it's not terribly different from today and that not everyone Hardly anyone really understood what they were doing, but they were doing it anyway, and the complaints and concerns started. So this is not new, and I've been around for just about all of it. So here you see on this first slide five different little vignettes of cases. They're all real. They're all cases in which I was involved, and um, mostly over the past couple of years, uh, four of them are in nursing homes, and one is not. So I'm going to start by going through these cases and uh, demonstrate uh, the various uh, underpinnings of psychosis. One thing about psychosis, it's a fairly consistent symptom with diverse causes. So that fits in with a lot of other things, especially in terms of behavior and psychiatric issues. There are multiple causes of common symptoms and also multiple symptoms from common causes. So this is really not a talk as much about the drug, although we're going to get to some practical implications as it is a reflection of an appreciation for the complexities and elegance of the human brain and how we really need at least some sense of what we're doing and why we're doing it rather than just doing it or doing it because we're afraid of what might happen if we don't do it or vice versa. So the first uh, case that I dealt with over the years was a 28-year-old uh, going back uh, to that slide, thanks, 28-year-old with rapid onset of mania and psychosis. This actually, um, a nurse I worked with uh, had them call me on, or call me on behalf of a friend of hers who had a son who never had a history of um, psychiatric disorder, but he smoked a lot of pot. What he had was a family history of mental illness. And he smoked so much pot that he got psychotic and manic. And I picked, uh, picked this up as on request about a year and a half into his treatment. And he was not doing very well. He was on um, an antipsychotic uh, risperidone. He was on an antidepressant, Welbutrin. He was on an anti-amanic uh, Depakote. And he just wasn't doing very well. So um, that's case number one. Case number two was a very interesting case of about five years ago in a nursing facility. It was a 61-year-old man who was admitted from home with pretty severe Parkinson's disease. It has to be pretty severe to go into a nursing home at the age of 61. It was on um, lots of uh, Cinemat, which is, as you know, Levodopa and Carbidopa. He was also on Resigiline or Azelect, which is another Parkinson medication. And then for the next nine months, the whole situation kind of crumbled and he had multiple symptoms with lots of hallucinations and delusions and agitation. And in between that, he said, I'm not doing well, I want more. And they gave him more. And then the family said he needs this and he needs that. And then he had a lot of symptoms. 
like nasal congestion and pain and they gave him opioids for the pain and this and that for the nasal congestion. By the time I picked him up nine months later, he was uh, having severe delirium and lots of psychotic symptoms and uh, it was a mess, complete mess. The third is an 82 year old with dementia who was in one of my facilities, this is about 15 years ago. Had dementia and the diagnosis with dementia was psychosis or psychotic features as they like to call it. And they decided um, a few months earlier that she hadn't had psychosis for a while so they took her off her antipsychotic. And uh, she went along for a while and then she started to uh, get more and more paranoid and delusional and angry and hostile and aggressive but they just gave her Ativan and maybe a little Depakote and figured, well, she's just anxious. Only trouble is um, she wasn't just anxious because one day all of a sudden she picked up a chair. She was just a little woman and she picked up a chair and smashed out the window to the front door. The fourth case is a woman who came into one of my facilities, 79 years old, already had a history of hypothyroidism for which she was on Synthroid. She went to the hospital and she was, um, she was problematic. She had not really had cognitive impairment previously, but she was problematic and confused and um, also psychotic, delusional and paranoid. And they sent her to my facility for post-acute care, and everybody saw that she was on Synthroid, so they figured, well, that's not the problem. So she got the usual Ativan and uh, other stuff, and other stuff routine. Only trouble was she wasn't doing well, so I got called into the picture. And uh, we'll come back to what we found and what happened with it. The fifth patient was someone with intellectual disability, lifelong, who was admitted to a facility down in the south somewhere with an alleged diagnosis of schizophrenia who had developmental disability. She came in on Haldol, 50, not 5 and not 15, but 50, 5 zero milligrams of Haldol daily. And she sort of laid around in bed and whimpered a bit and played with her doll and that was about it. And they were all afraid to do anything with it because they had no idea what had happened to her or how she got to this point or where the diagnosis came from. So they left it. So as you see, psychosis presents in many different cases and situations. Next slide. All right, so this is not a regulatory talk, and we're not going to talk about CMS, even though, as Michael pointed out, uh, the president and CMS are once again on the warpath, but as I'm trying to tell you, the warpath is a long one. It's been a warpath for almost a half a century. But this comes right from, as you see at the bottom, the CMS surveyor guidance, and I happen to be one of the relatively few physicians that's actually read it all the way through. In fact, I don't think a whole lot of people in nursing homes in any situation or position read it, but it's very instructive and worth reading. So I gave you the exact citation. And you can pull this down for free on um, Google. Just type in CMS State Operations Manual Appendix PP and it'll come up. But on page 511, it talks about specifically what we really want to talk about here, which is medication management based on the care process. And the care process includes recognition or identification of the issue, gathering of information, cause identification, management monitoring, and then revisiting the whole thing. And then it says, well, we're going to give nursing homes and the practitioners the opportunity to document their thinking. In other words, the basic elements of the care process. How did you reach this conclusion? On what basis? What is the evidence? What are the facts about the person that led you to this determination? I point this out because there's tremendous fear and loathing of the survey and fear of the quality measures, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is that we've always been given the opportunity to explain our thinking. The challenge has always been, do we have any thinking? What is our thinking? Or as many nursing homes do, do we just sort of call for a psych consult that then comes in, takes 30 charts into a back room, tinkers with the drugs, brings them out, changes orders, writes notes, and calls it a day. That's not all of them, of course, because there is some thinking 
manifest in the record, but as a medical director, I've read thousands of charts and I know that it's not widespread. Next slide. So now this comes from the Handbook of Differential Diagnosis, the DSM handbook, and you say, well, I don't need to know that except for the doctors and NPs on the call. Why do I need to know about differential diagnosis? And the answer is, if it's good enough and important enough to tell psychiatrists, then it must be relevant whether you're a psychiatrist or not. In fact, that's the case. Everything in the DSM handbook is about how to manage behavior and psychiatric issues the right way. They don't care who you are or what your degree or licensure is. If you're going to manage these patients or care for them, you kind of sort of have to know the right steps and the right process. So this is about the process that everyone needs to understand because it's not just a doctor thing or an NP thing. It's everybody's business to contribute to the right diagnosis. That was Michael's initial point. This says clearly, and I've highlighted, this is my highlighting, the first question in dealing with symptoms is whether they arise from a substance that exerts the direct effect on the CMS, CNS. Freudian slip there to say CMS. Okay, so a substance means primarily a medication, legal or illegal. Virtually any presentation in any setting can be caused by drugs. Missing a drug etiology is probably the single most common diagnostic error made in clinical practice. It's particularly unfortunate because a correct diagnosis has immediate treatment implications. So think to yourselves as I'm talking, what are they telling us in, in uh, the a American Psychiatric Association's Handbook of Differential Diagnosis? They're telling us that all behavior and psychiatric symptoms have causes, multiple causes of common symptoms. You cannot make a psychiatric diagnosis or figure out what to do about it just based on the symptom or the presentation. You must think about the causes. There is a good reason for telling everybody that the number one cause to consider is medications. Medications cause psychiatric symptoms. We'll come to that more in more detail in just a moment. It's unfortunate when you miss it because it's often simple, inexpensive, and as you'll see, it saves months if not years of torment for the patient and all kinds of problems for the facility of sending people back and forth to the hospital on one-on-one -on -one and hitting people and having to report um, resident to resident altercations. So in other words, something free and simple solves an awful lot of problems, but in order to do that, you have to know and then act on the knowledge that drugs frequently cause psychiatric symptoms. And I don't mean what President Biden's talking about or CMS, antipsychotics. I mean cardiac medications and urinary medications and even cough and cold medications and pain medications. In other words, I learned in 44 decades that every case that was presented to me, and it was thousands, my first move is to think seriously about the drugs. And I don't mean get a, pharma, a consultant pharmacist consult. I mean think seriously between nurses, doctors, and NPs and the interdisciplinary team. Next slide. So if you look at this handbook, and I recommend that every nursing home get a copy, you can get it for 24 bucks on Amazon. It's extremely uh, interesting and enlightening, and it helps you answer the question, what am I going to put in the record to prove to the surveyor or to prove to myself that the patient actually has or does not have the diagnosis they came in with? Because it really does take you through the thinking process, and it gives you something to fall back on. Not that you're going to turn into a psychiatrist, but you have every right and and the challenge to ask the right questions and say things like this doesn't seem to fit with what I've looked up about this particular diagnosis and we'll come to that one of our cases. From a diagnostic perspective ruling out a general etiology is one of the most important and difficult distinctions. So that leads to the question once again of why are we calling all these psych consults? Why are we letting everyone go to the book and order a psych consult whether you're a social worker or a nurse when the first steps are medical. The first key steps are rule out medical conditions and problems like delirium, which is 
behavior and psychiatric symptoms with a medical cause and rule out medications, this is what I call the undone homework of long-term care. Now, there are some who do this right and do it consistently, but we could avoid a lot of this stuff and a lot of the messes we get into and a lot of the psych consultants that just add to the mix and a lot of the uh, hand-wringing, a lot of the ER transfers and the middle of the night phone calls. We could avoid a lot of that if we actually did our homework. And our homework is not psychiatric, it's medical, medical and nursing. Virtually any psychiatric presentation can be caused by a medical condition. So if there's no other takeaway you get from this uh, presentation today, and you might have heard this before, but not necessarily in the detail I'm presenting it, we need to rethink how we do a lot of this because President Biden and CMS are not going to solve our problem. They're just going to keep beating up on us for not solving our own problem. We need to go, and I've told people this over the decades, we need to go by the book, and the book tells us what to do. The problem is you don't necessarily know what the book tells us to do unless you've read the book. Next slide. All right, again, um, this guy, of an ex-practitioner, published in the Wall Street Journal for everybody to see that if you get the diagnosis wrong, you, you'll probably get the treatment wrong. If the treatment's not working, then just doing more of it is probably going to make it worse. If this isn't a synopsis of the practice of psychiatric and behavioral medicine and nursing homes, I don't know what is. The wrong diagnosis will lead to the wrong treatment most of the time unless you're really lucky at guessing, and I would estimate the odds of guessing right at less than 5%. If you keep giving more of what's not working, whether it's Depakote or Ativan or Trazodone or, or um, Seroquel or whatever it is, you're going to have a mess. Next slide. So here we have, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this, this is how you distinguish the causes. For example, delirium, which is a medical cause of psychiatric symptoms and altered consciousness, has acute onset. Psychosis is more gradual, takes days to weeks, but dementia has a gradual onset that goes months to years. In delirium, I call it a roller coaster. It's like being on a, the brain is on a roller coaster. It's literally going up and down and up and down day in and day out. One moment they're off the wall and the next moment you can't wake them up. Whereas psychosis is like a stepladder. Each day it gets worse, just like the patient who put the chair through the door. Each day or each week it was getting progressively worse. It was worse on Thursday compared to Tuesday. It was worse the following Monday compared to the previous Thursday. And they missed it. Anxiety doesn't get that way. Anxiety sort of is constant with uh, intermittent waxing and waning. And dementia is progressive over an extended time. So it is possible to differentiate the causes and what is what makes it possible? The history. The history has been shown to be the most important, the most important uh, factor in enabling the diagnosis. And this goes back 70 years. I have slides that show how again and again, Studies show that it's the history, not the checklist, not the MDS, not the lab tests, not the consults. Yes, uh, a lot of the stuff I'll make available to you guys um, so that it can be posted on the site and you can get a copy of these good tools because I even have a tool for the differential diagnosis that I took out of another psychiatric book called Psychiatric Aspects of Neurological Diseases, and it's really handy. So yes, you won't have to do a lot of this yourselves, but the important thing is to understand why you should use it and work with it. Next slide. All right, so the second of the cases, the guy with Parkinson's was admitted because of a decline in functioning, impaired mobility and self-care, et cetera, et cetera. For the next nine months, it was, um, as the chef Gordon Ramsay uh, likes to use his uh, term on his TV show, Uncharted, bloody hell. It just went on and on with symptoms and more symptoms and drugs and more drugs. And while the attending physician sat in the bleachers and watched, a bunch of uh, other practitioners just kept uh, piling it on more and more. Next slide. So he came in with a lot of diagnoses. As you see in the next slide, isn't this typical? So here's another takeaway for you. One of the most effective and completely free and not very time consuming things that anybody can do to help manage patients of any kind, but especially behavior and psych, is to 
make take a few minutes to make sense of the admitting diagnoses. So this admitting diagnosis list is just a mishmash of stuff that you glance at it and you say, uh, well, let's move on. Now let's look at the same list of diagnoses in a very different way. That's the same list in the next slide. After grouping them together, you see that there's one neurological diagnosis and that's Parkinson's. If you know Parkinson's, you know that it has psychiatric consequences. However, this guy was labeled with unspecified psychosis, major depression, unspecified dementia, anxiety disorder, bipolar, and schizophrenia. I sure see this a lot. Bipolar and schizophrenia do not generally coexist simultaneously. The bottom line is every one of these diagnoses is wrong, wrong, and wronger. So the other diagnoses were more functional. They weren't causation. They were more consequences. So basically, this was a 61-year-old guy with Parkinson's who had a skin problem and high blood pressure, who had, went, had already gone through the mill and been mislabeled with diagnoses, who was on multiple Parkinson medications and came into the building. Next slide. So what this showed us was that grouping the diagnoses told us that um, this was a mess of uh, somebody else's making and people just sort of assumed it was right and kept going with it and kept putting them on drugs and they missed the all important clue that I already gave you guys. So before I tell you what that clue is or was, think to yourself, what clue did everybody miss that could have given them the answer to this guy's problems and actually wound up giving them the answer? Next slide. And the clue was his medication. So he already came in on Xanax and he liked his Xanax, but Xanax is a problem because it's short acting and it causes a lot of withdrawal. Carbidopa, levodopa has major psychiatric side effects as we'll see in a minute. And resigiline is an MAO inhibitor that interacts with a lot of other drugs and um, causes lots of problems. And they just kept piling it on. Then he was on Zolpidem for sleep. Next slide. So here's the outcomes of the cases. The one we just talked about, after nine months, I, I was brought into the picture. I recognized the answer was drugs, drugs and more drugs for nine months, chasing all of his symptoms and assuming they were all due to disease when they were all due to drugs piled on top of other drugs to chase the side effects. So when I finally stepped in and told them what needed to be done, after they pulled away a couple of the drugs, like his clonopin, which he had been put on, he got more agitated, which is not unusual or surprising when you start first pulling drugs away. And the, uh, the NPs basically got so furious at me that they put it all back on, all of it. And then he got delirious and the family demanded he be sent out where they sort of cleansed him of his drugs in the hospital and he survived uh, all of this. It would have taken no time flat to fix it, but it got fixed after nine months of hell. So case number three, the one who threw the chair through the wall, the problem there was they should never have taken her off for antipsychotic, or if they tried a GDR, they should have um, realized that it might re-emerge and they should have realized that you don't give Ativan and Depakote to people with a history of psychosis, as Michael alluded to, when they become psychotic again. You gotta know when to get rid of it, when to never do it again, when you may need it again and realize um, that you can't just do this indiscriminately. The woman with hypothyroidism was so psychotic that she needed to be put on Haldol. I put her on a half milligram of Haldol and she had a TSH of 17. So despite being on Synthroid, she was underdosed. So she had psychosis related to hypothyroidism and she needed Haldol for about six weeks. I put her on half a milligram the Jarrah psychiatrist, who I know very well, came along and doubled the dose. After six weeks, she became normalized again. She was no longer cognitively impaired, and we could discontinue it. And the, the woman who whimpered in bed and came in with the alleged schizophrenia, um, her Haldol got put down after about a month to zero because she didn't need it in the first place. Next. And I realize the time is running short, so we'll run through the rest of these in a, in a hurry. Another takeaway from this session is 
you all, I would strongly recommend you all go into Google as soon as you can and type in the following, medical letter, drugs that may cause psychiatric symptoms. That's all you need to type, medical letter, drugs that may cause psychiatric symptoms. And you can download a free copy of this. It was true in 2008. It was true when I first saw this in 2002, and it's true 20 years later that all the drugs in this list are commonly used drugs that cause psychiatric symptoms. Next slide. Here's two prominent examples. Parkinson drugs, it says right in that, uh, that thing from the medical letter, here's the side effects from Parkinson meds. They're all real. They're all very real. And that's what happened to patient number two. And then there's opioids, which made him even worse when he got put on it. But it's hardly known that opioids cause serious psychiatric symptoms. So we have lots of people get put on opioids and then they get put on Depakote or they get put on Ativan or they get put on Trazodone. And then they actually have a higher risk of death than if you just use antipsychotics because it's not recommended to combine benzodiazepines and opioids. Next slide. So just very quickly, we, it's, it's important to us to realize the, the, how the brain works, even if you're not a scientist, you're not a doctor. The brain is very much like a symphony orchestra. It has multiple parts, and the brain has to coordinate. The, the conductor is who coordinates all of this. Otherwise, you have a raucous, agitated mess from an orchestra that has no direction. If they're playing different pieces of music at the same time, or the, the woodwinds, or I mean, the, uh, the brass is so loud it drowns everybody else out. Well, the brain is very much like a symphony orchestra. It has to have coordination, synchronization, and some kind of uh, direction in order to function adequately and not be crazy. And um, when it goes awry, it, uh, it is a real problem. And uh, we have to realize that often when we give drugs, we're knocking the pins out from under a patient's brain. Or we may be helping it by improving the coordination and the uh, connections. Next slide. All right, just keep this in mind. Um, and that is, the brain is not, is all, when all said and done, it's a symphony of electrical current coming from multiple parts, multiple directions, multiple sources, and it has to be coordinated, just like the symphony orchestra. When we start giving drugs, they're all affecting the chemicals in the brain. You don't need to know what they all are. We're gonna skip over that in the interest of time. We have a couple more minutes, I'm told. So some of those chemicals in the brain act like an accelerator. For example, um, uh, serotonin, dopamine, these are drugs that uh, get things going. Other chemicals in the brain like dopamine or a GABA aminobutyric acid, GABA, tend to act as the brake. So the brain is actually a symphony of electricity, which has, as you'll see in the next slide, I think it's the next slide, a, just a handful of neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine, that's the one we give cholinesterase inhibitors. Dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, and glutamate. On top of that, there's things like thyroid hormone that affect the metabolism of the body and the cellular activity. So the brain is a symphony of multiple instruments, multiple sections and chemicals, and these all somehow have to coordinate. The end point is they either stimulate electrical current or they block it or inhibit it. And the trick here is there's got to be a balance where everything goes haywire. And when you start giving people drugs that affect the brain, it takes a, a lot of a skill and understanding to make it sort of synchronized. And it takes guessing or not knowing what you're doing to cause a lot of commotion and agitation in the brain. An agitated patient often has an agitated brain. Next. All right, we have 100 billion brain cells, although to look at the news, you wonder if anybody's using even two of them these days. We have 100 billion nerve cells and trillions of connections. Imagine trying to coordinate all this electrical current through trillions of pathways. That's why we have to, to be a lot more serious about medications. 
Okay. Um, that's why we have to be a lot serious about medications and realize that when people have Alzheimer's and other diseases, it sort of makes a mess of the, uh, the, the cells in the brain. All right, let's uh, just uh, wrap it up here. This is a picture of how these trillions of connections pass electrical current. It's not like plugging your lamp in. They have to jump the gap with chemicals, and that's what drugs affect. So we've come through, well, we've run through the background information, and there will be more to come, and a lot of this will be uh, posted for you. But we've talked about the importance of diagnosis, the importance of understanding that the brain is an extremely complex um, organ with trillions of connections and lots of chemicals, and it's important to understand what you're doing and think about why you're doing it and talk it through and use the care process and not just do it. So I'm going to stop there. Turn it back to Michael. Dr. Levinson, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for, there is so much in your talk. Uh, um, I, I, we're very thankful for, for this. And there's actually more, um, which we will bring to everyone uh, in the future, more, more to this talk related to psychosis, et cetera. So there's even more uh, that we can speak to. Um, um, Mrs. Smith, uh, this is our this is our the um, our person that we've been following through time. If you notice, she's been on Syracol twenty five milligrams for five years. Next slide, please. Um, it's now three months since her admission, and Mrs. Smith has she's doing better, right? Regained the ability to transfer and walks a few steps from rehab from hip from her hip fracture. She's mostly incontinent, but responds with time toileting tends to have loose stools. She enjoys her grandchildren's visits, although sometimes does not remember their names. Um, question for the chat. What's your recommendation regarding the use of Seroquel with what you know um, in Mrs. Smith and why? We'll give it a couple of minutes. Would you increase the dose? Would you decrease the dose? Would you, would you try to GDR it? Is there information that you need that you don't have? Good. Tell me why. If you put GDR in, tell me why you think that, 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 that that's a safe move here. I like the question. Can we find more about why she was on the Seroquel? That's a good question. Steve, what would you say? Well, it's a lot like the patient with the 50 milligrams of Haldol. She got put on it in the community because she must have had behavior issues. Who, who knows? But it's not like Geritol. It's not a psychiatric tonic. Right. So there's no evidence to support the fact that this woman has um, paranoia, hallucinations, or delusions, the hallmark of psychosis. Excellent. So it's not clear why she ever got on it. We uh, would want to ask the questions. And it probably, as someone points out, as Allison points out, she came with, from the hospital on it. But it's time for everyone on the interdisciplinary team to speak up and say, I don't get it. She doesn't meet the criteria for the use of an antipsychotic. So uh, once we find out that there's no evidence to support it, we don't necessarily want to stop these things in three days or a week, but we should uh, get moving. Beautiful. And be as long as she does well off of it, uh, as we reduce it, we can accelerate the pace. But as with the patient through the chair, through the door, if she starts to have a return of symptoms or she's not doing well, we may want to pause. So GDR is not always a straight slope to the termination of the drug. It may be a plateau or a right. stepwise fashion. Right. So excellent. And so I, th I think, and, and some of your, your comments have agreed uh, that this, this might be a place where GDR is appropriate, uh, not just discontinue it, as Dr. Levinson uh, brought through, but, but GDR, this, this might be a place to GDR and monitor. Good job. Uh, next slide, please. So um, qu any questions or discussion that we've missed? Anyone? Let's see. I don't see anything 
Sabine, that we've missed? I don't think we've missed anything. I want to uh, uh, thank Dr. Levinson for this really, um, uh, I have to say, informative and funny presentation that Joe told <laughs> had me cracked up. Um, I guess one of the things that was really enlightening for me, and, and I've been doing this for a while, is the, the diagnosis confusion that we are so often dealing with. I mean, this is what this little case you showed um, with, with, a, uh, with a, um, a patient uh, who had um, Parkinson's disease. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen older people who have had a, a seemingly normal life until let's say five years ago and have the diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective and dementia, you know, and they come like that. And, and it, it just boggles the mind and it. And I think we need to probably be more aggressive and clear about saying this is not compatible. You know, an 85-year-old schizophrenic patient who, who had a family and a function, seemingly functioning family and a daughter and daughters, that's probably not schizophrenia. Um, uh, would you agree, Steve? Absolutely. You can be delusional as much of the world seems to be these days and not be psychotic. You can be psychotic and not have schizophrenia, or you can just be agitated or have a symptom and not need anything at all, the key is to figure out what the cause of the problem is. And CMS and the, and the advocates are quite right about that. But where yeah. we have to go beyond them and not depend on them to fix our problems, is we have to dig deeper and figure this out when we inherit all these people who have been misdiagnosed in the community. And Sabine, I can't tell you how many thousands of times I've seen this over the years. People just pick up these diagnoses and then they stick, they stick like they were labeled with super glue. Yes. Yes. Stick and stick and stick, and everybody assumes it's right. And I'm telling you guys, the the erroneous diagnoses that I saw in my career of four decades is enormous. Mm -hmm. There's some great you. diagnoses over there, but it always needs to have the questions asked. How do we know this is true, especially with psych? Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Next slide, please. So as we, as we come to land our, our, uh, our webinar today, uh, we want to uh, let everybody know ab about the deprescribing spearhead group. Um, last, last month, we had Dr. Cheryl Huckins, and, uh, who's a medical director, and uh, Chrissy Para, who's an assistant uh, DON at uh, Evangelical Homes. If you remember, uh, they, they on their own uh, put together a, a de-prescribing framework and had some incredible reductions in benzodiazepines, anticholinergics, sliding scale insulins, and multivitamins. So this, and they have joined our spearhead group, and we are asking you to join our spearhead group too. If you are, or someone in your organization is moving the needle with polypharmacy, or hey, if you're not moving it yet, but you're trying to move the needle, that counts. Uh, please sign up uh, and and as and and be part of of the of the AMDA D to D uh, spearhead group. Next slide, please. And we would love to feature you next time. Yes. Um, and and because this is this is what this is all about, um, uh, Doctor um, uh, Doctor I forgot Huggins. Uh, yeah, Doctor Huggins. She taught me a lot, and I hope to learn from you as well. So if you have made some, even if it's just on one aspect, um, uh, and if you've made some improvement and you came up with something new that worked, um, you are the spearhead group. Let us know and we'll feature that. Great. Erin. Yes, this is Erin Vignet. I'm the Director of Clinical Affairs at AMDA. And I just wanted to let everyone in this group know about a new initiative that we'll be launching next week called More of a Good Thing. It's a framework to grow and strengthen the PALTC care force. And it's really a series of roundtable discussions that'll take place the last Thursday of each month, starting next Thursday, to talk about staffing. And we're really going to focus on practical strategies that you and your team can start using tomorrow to retain and recruit your care force. So I hope you can join us. It'll be led by Joanne Reisnyder, who's wonderful. She was a chief nursing officer at Genesis and is now at University of Maryland. So we'll, she'll be facilitating the discussions and we really look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Great. Uh, next slide. 
And this is just to remind you that uh, we'll have our progress update on uh, May 15th and our next webinar, uh, June 16th. Um, we, uh, this, the topic of antipsychotics is something we will continue with. We're not finished. We didn't believe we would get this in 45 minutes. So we will bring different dimensions of this conversation to you. We hope um, that you found it useful and helpful. Um, please note that uh, we extended the D2D. &D. This was supposed to finish, but, but um, it's still, it still works. So, but, but we're asking you to extend your uh, just re-register, go to the website and re-register so that you still get the, uh, you still get the, um, uh, the calendar invites and you can stay in touch with us. And Michael, just to be clear to everyone, um, two links have been added to the chat. So we um, added a link to re-register for Drive to Be Prescribed through December. And then I think two above it is the link to register for more of a good thing. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's what we have for you today. Thanks again. Dr. Stephen Levinson, thank you all thank for you. your comments. Um, um, uh, Dr. Von Price, thank you for facilitating. Have a great day and we'll see you in a month. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.